So I'm going to kind of start this talk off uh, a little cheery about how easy it is to go scale Bitcoin up. Yet, of course, in those other half of why it's so hard. And, you know, if you look at it from the point of view, say, you're a Web 2.0 developer, or your database manager, you know, anyone interested in standard scalability engineering, the blockchain's actually set up fairly well for that. You know, you've got your block headers, you've got your uh, transactions, you've got a Merkle tree. And the beauty of it is for your average client, you know, like my uh, wonderful little Android phone here, when I want to go make a transaction and Alice is sending Bob money, Bob's phone has a ability to go, to, you know, determine, well, is the transaction in the blockchain? And this is very easy. Could probably could use a bit more contrast there, but, you know, you just go follow up this tree. Standard computer science, trees have log in, uh, log to and scaling, and everything's all nice and happy. Similarly, well, let's go make it a web scale. Let's go and take this tree, let's go split it up, let's go shard it. Standard scaling technique. Um, right now, Bitcoin isn't that well suited for that for some technical reasons, but in principle, there's nothing stopping us from changing the Merkle tree algorithm to say index things by address. And then for your phone to determine what payments it is, it's just a matter of finding the right parts in the tree, asking the server, hey, do you have this? They reply back with proofs that you've gotten paid or not paid. And the beauty of that is, of course, like most sharding techniques, you just go split it up across a bunch of servers, and you throw hardware at the problem until everything works. Nice, simple, easy works. Problem is, well, we're not a simple Web 2.0 app. We don't have Facebook to just rely on. You know, we've got this notion of be your own bank. And really, I mean, this is quite fundamental to why Bitcoin works, which is that because no one is in charge, everyone participates in the consensus algorithm to some degree. Uh, frankly, you know, fully participating is mining. Less participating is running a full node. And by the time you get down to, say, my Android client, you're really just trusting others to do the work for you. Or in the case of, say, a web, web wallet like blockchain.info, you're really trusting others to do the work for you. You're essentially just saying, all right, I, don't, I have no ability to know what's going on. I'm just going to let them do the work for me. And this issue of trust is really important when you think about, well, who are we trusting in Bitcoin? From the perspective of my Android client, which does not verify the blockchain, the miners are a trusted third party. You know, we have this collective group of people who run this very strange digital signature algorithm, referred to, uh, this term's from uh, people at Blockstream, uh, the dynamic membership multi-party signature. I had to look at my screen to remember that one. And it's sort of this idea where, in conventional consensus algorithms, you start off with a fixed set of people participating. And Paxos and all these other um, consensus systems, you've got that fixed set. You go and run some magic, and you get a, a vote. And you come to consensus based on the outcome of this. Bitcoin, however, can't have a fixed set of people in it, or it wouldn't be very decentralized. You know, your centralization point would be, well, who decides who's participating in Bitcoin? So instead, we use proof of work. That means that we can, the people being this membership in this magical signature all can come and leave. And thus, we have a multi-party signature where the parties are dynamic. People can come and leave by the mining. And they basically say, this is what the blockchain is. I'm sorry, but that is a trusted third party. Now, it's one that we can verify. If you run a full node, you know what they're doing. But that's all you really know. You don't have a stake in it. You know, you don't have the ability to participate. And if you're not running a full node, you're not really that much different than, say, trusting PayPal to do the work for you in a magical hypothetical world where PayPal opens their books. I mean, in particular, the stuff that you know, we really hear from PayPal, which is people freezing money, well, I mean, there's no way my Android phone can force a miner to make a transaction go through. So they are that trusted party that can go break my stuff and force me to not be able to spend my money. And then once we start looking at the nuances of, well, how does this trust work, then things start to look even more ugly. I mean, 
let's go look at you know detecting an invalid block. You know, let's imagine that reddish square is a transaction that made 40 bitcoins out of thin air. And I've got to actually go try this, but as far as I know, an SPV client like my Android wallet wouldn't even notice that. I'd say, oh yeah, 40 million bitcoins, sounds legit to me, and it would show up. I mean, you could certainly go and fake any number under that. You know, you can go create money out of thin air. It'll trace its back up to, way up to the tree, and that looks okay. And with things like UTXO set commitments, TXO set commitments, we can at least say that if you're looking at the right piece of data, you'll detect that something's invalid. You know, I could go say, well, this doesn't look right because the transaction that funded this transaction only had one Bitcoin out of it. Now there's more Bitcoins being produced than uh, being destroyed, something's wrong. We can flag that as an invalid transaction. But there's really no good way if you're, say, off on the other side to be sure that you'll actually see that. You know, how do you know that, you've, that somebody has seen that part of the consensus space? You don't. And it gets even more ugly when you look at double spends. You know, if Alice gives the same bitcoins to Bob and Charlie at the same time, on either side of the blockchain tree, things look valid. Alice spent bitcoins on one side, Alice spent bitcoins on the other side. Everything checks out. It's just she magically created bitcoins out of thin air. And again, how do you, in a decentralized way, where every node <coughs> participates in less than the full consensus, do you scale this up? It's not really clear. And you know, this is where I could go on for a couple hours talking about the various schemes people have tried to come up with. But ultimately, I mean, this is why it's so hard. Because there is. That specific problem is a simple technical solution. Hmm? That specific problem is a simple technical solution. You make it so that the um, transaction needs to appear in both Alice's and Bob's part of the tree if there's a transfer. That's deemed invalid if it wasn't a question. Well, your underlying issue is systems like that, you have to be sure that somebody is actually auditing you know, the right parts of the tree. Um, I mean, to get maybe a little more technical, so. You know, what actually enforces miners to really publish the data that corresponds to a block? You know, it's easy to imagine a system where people take shortcuts and say, well, I'm going to run this very highly scalable node that only passes around block headers and say passes around parts of the blockchain. Well, if I want to go and fake some bitcoins from the perspective of someone, I would go and run some mining power. I would then go set up some fake nodes so that it's likely that when you connect to one of my nodes with your Android client, it will not go relay on messages saying, hang on, I found this invalid part of the chain. People should know about this. I would filter that out from you. And then all you're ever seeing is the parts of the blockchain that don't have that invalid part of data. And as long as you're scaling up by sharding things, it's very much non-trivial to go solve this problem. Uh, you, you can make it so that a miner can only be they can only worry about a particular sharded part and trust everyone else for all the other parts, but it's still fundamentally sharded. Yeah, well, I mean, for example, my tree chain system, um, I kind of went down that path and I realized, hang on a second, if a miner is trusting other people for parts, what happens if it's wrong? I mean, go back for a second. I mean, suppose, you know, this invalid transaction is only found out afterwards. Well, what do you do to the blockchain? Do you roll back? You know, if you're able to go move money between one part of the chain and the other, well, a lot of people's transactions could become invalid by this bad transaction suddenly being announced. People's nodes seeing, hang on, this is bad. I have to reject this part of the chain. Yet it's also often very easy to go and hide that fact from other people because flood fill networks aren't reliable. Yeah, a miner can verify that their sharded part has good integrity and transactions in and out of it have good integrity. The problem is there are potential attacks where the entire chain gets invalidated due to something and some other shard being just totally invalid. Yeah, I mean, with your double spend example, both sides look okay. They're only invalid <coughs> because something happened on two sides at once. Good. Or if you go and make your shards such that you can only go spend bitcoins in certain parts of your chain, 
Well, now you have the problem that it's very non-trivial moving money from one person to another. You know, if your client is set up to follow one part of the Bitcoin blockchain, and mine is set up to follow another shard. I think you're not quite right there. You can make it so that someone who's in charge of that else to Bob part, in charge of Alice's part, can verify that that was all valid and kosher. The problem is if you accept a chain or somewhere way out there, yes. like there's Igor ascending to Veronica and that was just wrong and invalid, just garbage or non-existent data and you trusted that, that can invalidate your transactions here. That's what really concerns me. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In, okay. yeah. And well, what are what are some solutions before we talk about that, that wonderful stuff? I mean, and I really like this uh, way of talking about it because Bitcoin really does have O n squared scaling. If you assume everyone validates everything with the current algorithm, well, bubble sorts, same scaling, and you can improve it by making things faster, by trying to go and optimize the code, using less network bandwidth. But ultimately, you run into this problem that no matter how hard you push it, the underlying algorithm still doesn't scale. You know, we might be able to say make Bitcoin run at 10 times transaction volume, 100 times. But at some point, it's going to break down. You know, at some point, you run into this fundamental scaling issue. The other issue is, you know, this isn't really a technical debate. It's in part a technical debate in that there's certainly technical aspects to what the trade-offs are. But how you determine what trade-offs you follow is ultimately political. You know, we can certainly go and scale up 10 times at the expense of people who have 10 times less internet bandwidth than we do. If I'm, say, off in Russia, and I wish to participate fully in Bitcoin, and fast forward 10 years, and now the Russian government is trying to crack down very heavily on people using Bitcoin, well, unfortunately, I'm probably going to have an internet connection that's filtered. I will not be able to get enough bandwidth to actually get the full blockchain and keep up with it, and especially keep up with it uh, with low enough latency that I can go mine profitably. And fundamentally, you're saying by scaling it up this way, we're going to trade off the fact that this Russian guy can participate in exchange for people in freer countries being able to participate. You know, at some point, you scale up sufficiently that a lot of people can't participate, and then it's very unclear as to, well, how do you prevent Bitcoin from being regulated? And if it is regulated, well, what is the advantage of it over simpler systems like PayPal, like your money transfer, um, systems already exist between banks. You know, frankly, everything Bitcoin can do, other systems could adopt, but based on having trusted entities sign your, sign your blocks. Now, other solutions then get into, well, transacting Bitcoins without actually using the blockchain. Uh, ChangeDip is a great example. Bitcoin transactions are already too expensive to send someone, you know, a couple pennies as a tip. So change ship is really just a database with a bunch of Bitcoins held in reserve, and they update the database. Right now, change ship doesn't have any auditing trails, any proof of solvency. You don't really know if they have your Bitcoins. But I mean, me personally, I've got 20 bucks on change ship account. I don't really care that much if they go to business and take my money. You know, that's a risk I can take on. For larger amounts of money, you can apply various mitigating measures. One of the more interesting ones is hub and spoke payment channels, where a payment channel is essentially a way of me going to say Alice and setting up a two of two multi-sig where we put some money in as a deposit, and then we go spend that money from that deposit address to Alice in a series of transactions that gradually move more and more of it. But only the last transaction is actually signed by both parties. So in essence, we have a way of moving money from one party to another instantly, provided we lock up a certain amount in advance. Well, if Alice is then connected to Bob, I can go send money to Bob by sending money to Alice in a small amount. She then sends it on to Bob. And now we have a system where anyone using the same payment channel hub can send money instantly to someone else. You know, I think somewhere here we've got the people behind uh, the light, um, Lightning Network which is a proposal along these lines to go and do exactly this. They still go use centralized points, but at least they're not trusted points, and you can pick yours. And if everyone on the Silk Road wants to do instant payments and not have to pay transaction fees and also potentially have more privacy than the guys using Ch um, ChangeTip or Coinbase as their hub, 
Well, you get to go pick who you trust. And with crypto like Xiaomi tokens, you may not even have a privacy problem there. So, you know, it's a trade-off. And as for fundamental improvements, this is where we get into the, all right, how, how far can we go change the algorithm? You know, I mentioned tree chains earlier. Um, Vitalik, he's been working on various ideas with hypercubes where you'd have different parts of the blockchain and these shards being mined simultaneously but multiple parts. And the idea there's enough sort of overlapping levels of trust that it's, you know, you can't get away with fraud essentially. And equally, hopefully, that there's enough overlapping levels of trust that there's not large enough centralized players that anyone can be in a position where they can go censor transactions. It's certainly a lot more complex, unfortunately. And again, this is one of those political things. You're trading off a lot of technical complexity for a system that scales better and potentially will go and you know, allow that guy off in Russia to participate fully in the sense that yes, he's mining and yes, he's contributing to the decision making, what transactions get in the blockchain. There's also things like side chains, which I would go argue aren't necessarily a scaling solution, but some people argue them. You know, various iterations of that with uh, merge mine side chains and non-merge mine and so on. So there's a lot of iterations there. And I don't know, maybe someone's gonna come up with something new too, but Again, going back to politics, it's certainly easier to just go turn that knob and change the scalability and by making Bitcoin less decentralized. So I don't really know where that political debate's gonna gonna end up. Thank you. <laughs> Questions. I am looking at you. <laughs> Well, you know, I think the my big picture summary of that stuff is it's really not very interesting. You know, we've got this number, and the number could be 10 megabytes, it could be 100, it could be, well, as I kind of tweeted recently, one byte. And at some point it's useless, the so one byte is not a very useful number. 100 kilobytes probably is a useful number, but, you know, trying to resolve scalability by just making that number bigger, ultimately you're going to end up at the point where the p politics of the situation fails and that you've you know, turned that knob up to the point where people who should be participating fully in Bitcoin can't. And as you turn that up, well, inevitably you're going to have not that many mining pools left. You know, you're going to have not that many people with a copy of the full chain. And then it becomes, at some point, the level where it's easier and easier to regulate Bitcoin. Where exactly that level is, I don't know. That's not a really technical question. It's a political question. Uh, on, the, on the supply and demand side of things, so one way to scale up is to increase the supply of transactions. Uh, the other way is to reduce the demand. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, uh, say, relatively short-term outlook for potentially increasing transaction costs and how that might play out? Well, it's hard to predict because you don't know how many people need transactions. I mean, every time I, you know, I do a lot of consulting for companies, and every time they go present me with a plan that assumes transactions are cheap, I kind of tell them, well, how expensive would your business be to run if there were 100 of you, you know, even just 10 of you? I mean, I was talking to an exchange the other day that had this idea of doing thousands of transactions every day for various escrow and, uh, uh, what's the right term? Like, you know, essentially escrow contracts to, you know, make bets on uh, various price, pricing information. And I just had to tell them, well, the reality is, I mean, it's not clear that your business is viable if there are 10 other exchanges like you. At some point, you're gonna be in competition for this limited block, block size. You know, it's a simple auction market. Every transaction you send has a fee, and miners put into their blocks, for the most part, whatever fee pays the most per kilobyte. That goes in first, and everyone else kind of gets bumped off. Even behave properly if transactions are never going through because the fees are not high enough. Well, that's an easy fix. I mean, this is something you can go fix in like a few hours of work. 
Well, I mean, as an example, with Bitcoin QT, you know, if I go and can't get a transaction to be mined, I can go and download a copy of GitHub slash Peter Todd slash replace by fee tools. And I think, actually I need to go write that one, but, but undo.py will go and undo a transaction with a higher fee or you can bump the fee on it with a higher fee. And yes, there is you know, a certain amount of infrastructure that we are missing, but for the most part, it's not in that bad a situation. Do you mean a follow-on transaction? Uh, well, the way that one implements is to re double spend the transaction with a higher fee. Yeah. But yeah, there's many options there. Yeah, it seems to be like the big point of contention right now is whether one should prepare for transaction prices to go up or whether one should try and avoid transaction prices going up. I, for one, just want to see the experiment happen. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, this goes back to kind of the politics. You know, we had a, what's called the soft limit, um, which was the default maximum block size miners would generate. And that used to be, uh, I think, 250K, and then it got bumped up to like 500 kilobytes, and finally it got bumped up to 900, I think, is the default right now. And there was very p quick political pressure to bump that up as transaction volume increased. And of course, when transaction volume dropped again, I mean, no one changed it. And currently, there are some problems with this where you can DOS attack the Bitcoin network with relatively little money by just sending a ton of transactions that aren't likely to get mined because you know default fees are being adjusted and watching as mempools fill up and nodes run out of memory. It's not an attack that's that cheap to run. You need a fair bit of memory, you know, a fair bit of Bitcoins, but it can happen. Well, people should also fix the damn software. Yes, <laughs> but it's not yeah, not yeah, it's very scary to fix this stuff. Okay. Well, you can, you can just throw out the transactions from memory. Just, yeah. you know, any, anything you change can no, go break things. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I mean, remember, like, if this sort of thing happens, what will people really do? They'll go and type a bash shell script that says, while true, run Bitcoin D. If it crashes, uh, just restart it. Uh, and that will actually fix the problem for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> so what, um, what do the idea and discuss for uh, scaling Bitcoin do you support? I support anything but just turning the knob up higher, because that's the least interesting one that you know will fail eventually. In the same way that you know, I mean, I've given the analogy of well, imagining we're all in a coal mine trying to get that last bit of coal, and someone looks, hey, you know, see those roof pillars? Like, why don't we just go take all that coal? I mean, here, I've got my pickaxe. Look, I've, I've taken half of it. I mean, nothing's happened yet, because you know, at some point, it will fail. And when it fails, it's not really clear, can we create another Bitcoin and not get, say, 51% attacks in the beginning? You know, if Bitcoin started now, with all the attention it received, it's a pretty good chance somebody's going to say, you know what, I don't want this to exist, and I'm going to go kill it off when it's young. So this isn't necessarily something where we get a second chance. Not to mention, we've got billions of dollars worth of value here, so it's not something you take lightly. I mean, personally, I figure the transaction fees thing going up because it's a market, the market will create solutions to this. They may not necessarily be the pretty solutions we want, but we will find solutions. And you know, it's a thing that kind of happens relatively gradually. In the same way that change chip is a part of a solution, it happened precisely because someone couldn't afford to send a tip over the blockchain. It may not be the prettiest solution we want because nobody cares if they lose 20 bucks, but you know, that can change with time. So there's demand from people that if they adopt sends a signal about the value of this thing, wonderful thing you like so much. Um, you think I'm not sure I'm not sure exactly what the specific I get the problems, there's a lot of them, totally. The specific recommendation then is we don't increase block size and the people who want to adopt because they have large volumes and they heard about the blockchain and they're interested. The recommendation for them is you're going to have to only put uh, part of it to be a proof of existence hash or you're going to have to keep it semi-decentralized or you can have a backlog of a few days for all your transactions to get into the current block size. Potentially never remember, you know. So I, I like, 
if there is this planned uptick in adoption, what is like what's the, what do you think should happen? I don't think we have a good solution because the technology fundamentally doesn't scale yet. You know, if I were to go to the next change ship and say, yeah, you should just use Bitcoin on blockchain transactions because it's the best thing, I'd be lying to them because I can't give them a solution that'll let a hundred of them exist. You know, there is no way we can have a system that scales at this level, as n squared, scale to the whole world. It will break at some point. And if we go down this path, I think, of saying, you know, political path of saying every time transactions get a little more expensive, we just decrease the decentralization. You know, it's really unclear where does that go. Do, does transaction volume, you know, <coughs> taper off before we hit the point where Bitcoin really starts to look very much like PayPal again? You know, that's not something we can guarantee if you go down that path. Well, there's also very little incentive to develop and even less incentive to adopt actual scaling solutions unless the actual scaling limits are kept. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely true. You know, if, if you just go and let someone else go and uh, take on the problem, well, you know, there's no incentive for you to, you to try to solve it until uh, Bitcoin falls down. I mean, it's very problematic with SPV nodes because they don't pay any of the costs of securing the network other than transaction fees and inflation. You know, they don't run full, you know, they don't directly pay for full nodes. You can't expect any one miner to hold back on how many transactions they put into the whole thing because they get transaction fees right then and storing that data until the end of time is everybody else's problem. Yeah, and it gets even worse actually, which is that, you know, as an example, it's been proposed a few times that you just make there be no block size limit. And the theory is transactions Every transaction you add makes it a little more likely that um, you know, your block will be orphaned and someone else will find a block before your block's built on. Well, as it turns out, once you get to a transaction about 30% of the hashing power, the math doesn't actually work that way. It's that you're already one block ahead, so the competition now has to find two blocks to beat you. It's more likely for you to find one more block and stay ahead of them than for them to find two blocks. Therefore, you don't have an incentive to help those other miners mine which is propping your block to them. And it's, you're gonna earn more money in terms of transaction fees by not investing in network capacity, not peering with other miners, and also by adding you know, larger and larger, um, by making larger and larger blocks. And equally, if you're making your money mainly off the subsidy, well, you may earn less subsidy temporarily, but those other miners are gonna lose money, they're gonna get out of the race, and in the long run, you'll be the winner. You know, that, it's a very unfortunate thing. It's kind of like the selfish mining, although I'd argue a bit more basic, but you know, as long as Bitcoin kind of has that incentive, we can't even rely on things like that to discourage miners. Uh, it's also important to point out that uh, raising the size limit is a hard form. Uh, yes, creating. sort of. If you were willing to make SPV stop working, you can do it as a stop work. Yeah, from the point of view of my Android client, <laughs> you know, it doesn't know what the block size is. You can do anything you want. And the thing is, any set of miners who have enough money to go and run mining equipment, run pools, and so on, it's very trivial for them to set up a bunch of Bitcoin nodes so that when my SPV client connects to the network, it's likely to connect to their nodes and not the ones still respecting the one megabyte block size limit. You know, I mean, I kind of would argue that in general, we underestimate how much we trust miners. You know, if they decided, say, the inflation subsidy should be doubled, you know, let's make 50 Bitcoins per block forever. The reality is if like 95% of the miners switch to that, what it really says is that for the 5% who aren't, they have an insecure system that could be easily attacked. Therefore, why should it be valuable? I mean, you're discounting the economic majority though. But, like, if but we don't know. Your Bitcoins are potentially useless at that point because you can't go to anyone who's running a full node. And in fact, most of the people who accept Bitcoin for goods and services do run a full node. But I think you're making an assumption about my uh, hypothetical example here, which is I'm not saying that it's a guaranteed that the miners who decide 50 bitcoins per block is the way to go will end up with a bitcoin that's worth anything. I'm saying that if they choose to go down that path, it's guaranteed that the existing bitcoin protocol will become useless. It's, no, I mean, this is the definition of network attack, right? This is the de definition of a large scale civil attack where you're pumping the network within a thousand blocks and Serving the quote unquote valid chain, which is valid to other phone numbers. Not so, civil yes, attack, 51% attack. It's not a 51% attack because it's invalid to other phone 
sure, it's a 51% attack against SPV nodes, but that's not a 51% attack against uh, but, the economic majority. I mean, it's remember. It's a huge deal. Like, the, SPV nodes are the only. Yeah, you can but, but remember, the argument I'm making is a bit subtle. Only Android clients, because a lot of them are just Coinbase wallets, yeah. which are what. But remember, the argument I'm making is a little more subtle than that. It's to go say that this would create a crisis of confidence in whether or not Bitcoin's viable. Because again, let's assume that 95% of the mining power has decided that 50 Bitcoins per block is the way to go. Again, what that says is that for the 5%, you've got a network that could be easily 51% attacked. Yeah, Those 95% could say, all right, let's go and just kill this off. Because people- what if 95% of the miners just decided, you know what, we're better off attacking the network, so let's just attack Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes, but, 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 but- Okay, you don't need to have a discussion about any kind of specific attack. If 95% of the miners want to attack the network, they can destroy the network. Well, yeah. yes. And again, I mean, I think people, I, I, I think people often, often miss this nuance, which is that in an environment where Bitcoin may not work because miners do not believe that they're earning enough money, it is not clear that the actions of full nodes really mean that much. Because ultimately, the 51% majority is what the Bitcoin network trusts. It may be, have some technical nuance, but from the social point of view, if you have enough miners say this is not how we wish to continue Bitcoin, yeah, it's very unclear. I mean, model is 51% is not colluding. Yes, but I'm, I'm not making. 51% colluding. Like, let's all but, but I'm not making a technical argument here. I'm making a political argument. Yes, and the political argument, like the technical That's argument, how the market really works. Like, it's yeah. the same thing. It's the point, right? Bitcoin is not secure under a technical model. Because it relies very heavily on game theory and yes. structures. And yeah, you're right. If you have a bunch of people collude, then we're fucked. Well, let's go with the example of let's suppose the economic majority decided that a larger block size was not a good idea. It would be very easy for a minor majority to essentially push through a larger block size through that exact mechanism. Uh, or I assume you're not talking about these soft fork approaches to increasing the block size where you change the format. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not really getting into tech, technical things at all there. I'm just saying that if you could convince a majority of mining power to do a hard fork, the reality is that economic majority is mostly forced to go along with it. Now, the, the majority of mining power is putting themselves in a very risky position because they may destroy the value of Bitcoin. But it's, if... But you're saying, like, okay, if 50% of the number of cash power decides to hold Bitcoin hostage so that they can get more money, yeah, you've destroyed Bitcoin, you've destroyed the, like, no one has confidence in the system anymore. It's not really even relevant anymore whether or not they're getting more Bitcoins or not, because no one has confidence. But again, remember the example I'm giving. I mean, it's easy to explain it as, well, they wish to just increase the reward. But something that, say, a hard fork to increase the block size, it's a lot more nuanced. Like, what does this really say? What is the economic majority? You know, it's suddenly not very clear. Yeah. Well, this is not a very out there possibility Yes. Are much, much than they yeah. are right now. And uh, that would not be a stable forkage in that anyone who was a miner who was working on the smaller thing, if that even sort of kind of started to look less reputable than the one with the mining rewards increased, everyone would be incented to just get their larger mining rewards yep. by switching over to the other one. Yeah. I mean, yes and no. Depends, like, uh, yeah, if. 95% of the network hash power decides we want a bigger block size and we're just going to do it. And you can either do it or not. And if Coinbase decides, or if more specifically BitPay decides, like, uh, actually, no, this is bullshit, we're going to ignore this, then yes, they're reducing their security to essentially these people who want to hold us hostage and uh, <laughs> double spend them. But that doesn't mean they well, necessarily. They might but all these guys who are building all these extra they, bitcoins, they can't. But they, they might also destroy their interoperability if they do that as well. Yeah, so it depends on the majority of the economic majority. Like, a, a <coughs> the economic majority. Right, but you're looking at it from the point of view of what is wallet software going to do. The wallet software actually doesn't know. Most wallet software is Coinbase. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why all this stuff is very fragile. I mean, what, what does the economic majority really mean? It means Coinbase and BitPay and BitStay. Well, but, 
We don't necessarily know that. But hang on, we don't necessarily know that because if something happens where the economic majority of people who are legally own, owning those Bitcoins decides we don't like Coinbase anymore, they can very quickly move out. And now Coinbase is no longer the people no, in control of the economic majority. Because when I go to Dell.com and I want to buy a laptop, Coinbase is the one who's accepting the payment. Yeah, but, 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 you, it, but you're, I think you're looking at it from the wrong way. You're not looking at, you're looking at sort of very sort of technical thing of who is, where's the money right now? But no, who not, is? Not where the money is, where the place that I can get value in exchange, like money only has value because I can get goods and services for it. And those goods and services are defined by Coinbase. Well, but again, this can change very quickly because the people who actually no, own the Bitcoins. Dell can't switch very quickly. Sure they can. can switch to BitPay. No, all these online stores don't run their own nodes with like full software stacks. But, but, but again, you're, you're also assuming something that is also not true, which is this idea of the economic, that the reason why Bitcoins are valuable is because of this good and ser services thing. That's well, the definition of economic value. No, let's look at gold. Yeah. Because the definition is you can get something else that you can exchange for goods and services from. Is gold valuable? It's only valuable because I can sell it for dollars, which I can go with then buy a drink. Okay, but so Bitcoin can be the same thing. I mean, if Coinbase and BitPay go down, Bitcoin doesn't become worthless overnight because I have a reasonable presumption that in the future, I will be able to go sell it for something. Well, it may be the new value. competitors. Because you've destroyed the market. No, you but again. Have, yeah, you can still go on local Bitcoin and you can find something locally here you can buy them. But, but again, this isn't a sticky situation. Because if Coinbase and Bitcoin decide, all right, we're going to go with this fork, and the economic majority is fine, but people who legally hold those Bitcoins decide, no, that's bullshit, and they manage to get themselves in control of the Bitcoins again through the private keys, whether or not Coinbase or Bitcoin, you know, BitPay still exists, I mean, it's doesn't not, mean I mean, much. It's, it's not sticky in the same way that, like, oh, if my currency completely collapses and is devalued, and we have runaway inflation, you know, in, say, Weimar Germany. <laughs> it's not sticky because, like, oh, eventually that might be worth something, and I can still hold on to it, and eventually I'll be able to get it back. But, like, if you've destroyed the value, yes, in theory, it could come back, but it also might not, and you well, walk away. Well, value moment to moment is what people think of what it's going to look like in the future. You do not need Coinbase and BitPay to exist continuously, uninterrupted, for Bitcoin to still maintain value. In the same way that if I have a piece of gold, it's not trivial for me to just go sell it and actually get you know, a laptop. There can be a lot of fuzziness there. There can be a lot of delays. I might reasonably say, well, really. I'm going to be able to in the future. Yes, but again, if I'm in a place where that's not trivial, I can extend that time window. In the same way that if Coinbase and BitPay decide to go against the economic majority defined by who legally owns the Bitcoins, that's not going to affect so the price. You, it's going to add uncertainty. The scalability uh, question has shifted a little bit. Um, and you've alluded to this. But basically, if there's going to be a digital currency that's the foundation for the global economy, say, in the future. That's the vision, OK? <laughs> now, what you have said in an indirect manner is that you can take the Bitcoin protocol stack, and you can tweak the knobs, and turn the dial on the block size, and turn this dial. And there are consequences and unintended consequences, and there's some political issues, and things kick in. And it seems that your view is turning those knobs in an incremental evolutionary manner is bound to fail ultimately for the goal of satisfying the needs of the global economy. So then the question is, looking to the future, what would a digital currency platform that could support a thousand x or ten thousand x more transactions or a hundred thousand x more transactions than the current Bitcoin stack. What would that look like? What would it be? Um, and specifically, you had written a note like um, a year ago, a you know, proposal for a tree structure. Yeah. Uh, you know, would it would it look like that? Or you know, how has your thinking evolved? But the, again, how would you satisfy the scalability needs? of the global economy with a digital currency platform. So the tree chains concept, I would actually describe it as sort of a very purist model. 
which is assuming a bunch of stuff happens just right, we could in theory have this wonderful thing that would be all great and would scale indefinitely for any digital currency, any, you know, anything we wanted to do with an immutable ledger. I really don't think we're going to go that road. I suspect it's much more likely we'll just have incremental changes and we'll probably end up in a system where the block size is roughly the same as it is today, maybe exactly the same, and you have a hell of a lot of services built on top of it, you know, in the same way that you could run, you know, economy backed by gold. I mean, let's ignore, you know, macroeconomics for a moment here, but, you know, in principle, you could run it backed by gold by having some underlying ledger layer where our magic gold somehow proves mathematically that it exists, and then various other ledgers built on top of it that move numbers around within the scope of that ledger. You know, and you can build a lot of this, you know, have a lot of trade-offs, and the important thing is that each individual system can meet the needs of the people who want to use it. They will end up having some kind of third party in some sense that they trust in some way. I mean, in the case of Hub and Spoke, the trust may be very small. It's that, you know, in exchange for having some money locked up on this thing in a guaranteed way, all you can really do is delay me in getting my money back and potentially invade my privacy. But it's fundamentally based on that settlement, all the serious proposals for scaling things, aside from just flat out um, the, the, the one instrument of, hey, let's just make the block size bigger. Yeah. All the other approaches basically are one way or another, we're going to do net settlement instead of putting every single thing that happens on the blockchain. Yes, and the question may be in your net settlement um, system, in some cases, someone has the ability to take your money. In other cases, they only have the ability to go and freeze your money temporarily. And in some cases, well, they could go take your money, but you're guaranteed to go and punish them in some way and make it not worth their while economically. I guess uh, my question is, uh, considering this, uh, this uh, clause or problems that, that you identified, in your subjective opinion, like uh, we, we discuss uh, the possibility of Bitcoin becoming the foundation for a global economic system. Like, how likely do you think uh, it is that that it can become that versus that? I mean, technically speaking, yes, it can. Politically speaking, I find it very unlikely that it will because, you know, the moment you get into spheres where you are obeying the law. Bitcoin can be outcompeted by things that are centralized. You know, they have someone in control of the ledger. You may be able to audit that someone, but you know, as long as you go trust them, it's all right. In the same way that, for most part, credit cards still work pretty well for most people. PayPal works pretty well for most people. Bank transfers work pretty well for most people. You know, Bitcoin kind of fits that niche where it's not working. And the reason why it's not working varies. You know, if you're a drug dealer, PayPal is kind of problematic because it's not private. A lot of people don't have that need. And the more expensive decentralized systems that do provide those guarantees that a lot of people don't need, they get outcompeted. <laughs> well, it depends on how you use it. I mean, the reality is Bitcoin, from the point of view of an investigator, is a real nightmare to go track. You know, I mean, I've talked to people from the FBI about, you know, how easy is it really to go track the Bitcoin blockchain? And it's a nightmare. I mean, it's even the existing uh, conventional fiat system, in practice, if you have enough money, you can do anonymous transactions with fiat. And I don't mean cash, I mean with the actual banking system. Because you put enough layers between you know, the source and the destination that anyone trying to go track where, where does the money actually flow eventually gives up. You know, someone loses a record somewhere in between and the investigator stops. And there's a lot of ways you can go do this. It's not available to us because we don't have enough money to pay a lot of lawyers. People but probably have better forensic Bitcoin blockchain investigation skills than the FBI tell a somewhat different story about. At least you just attract people that. I again, I mean, the reality is you can build systems on top of this to go and get rid of that layer. You know, a lot of the current technologies kind of suck. CoinJoin isn't great. I mean, I and Gregory Maxwell, when you know he was originally proposing the idea. Frankly, our discussion about CoinJoin wasn't we're going to solve Bitcoin privacy. It's that we're going to go and say Bitcoin privacy is necessary. Someone will actually solve it later, but we will create a system that has some privacy and sets us on a path to more privacy rather than sets on a path to less privacy. 
Similarly, you know, Zerocache will come out at some point, and you can use Zerocache to trade Bitcoins anonymously. Yeah, I mean, again, the point is that there are ways to go and move money around in Bitcoin anonymously. And it has much better properties than most fiat systems for people with not that much money. For people with a lot of money, at some point they can just go hire some pilots to go and send an airplane full of gold across the world. Or as actually happens a lot, um, buy and sell artworks. But, you know, for someone without, without enough money to go pay those fees, Bitcoin works pretty well. And, you know, it's... I think it's very misleading to go and say, you know, Bitcoin's not private, because you certainly can use it in ways that are private, you certainly can use it in ways that aren't. But the fact that you have an option is immediately much better off than most systems. Is the privacy requirement for full fungibility, or rather the full fungibility is the, uh, <clears throat> gives rise to privacy, full privacy? Yeah, and you know, I'd also go point out that we don't necessarily need perfect privacy for the privacy that you do have to drive fungibility. You know, even if it's in theory possible to go trace a transaction, you can add a lot of stickiness to anyone trying to say blacklist bitcoins by just making it that those blacklists are very likely to end up in trapping a lot of people who had nothing to do with the crime. You know, that's very different from this notion of full privacy, but a small amount of privacy can go a long way in terms of fungibility. I mean, just look at how uh, much flat Coinbase gets for seizing people's funds. You know, that's in the existing system, yet a lot of people will not use Coinbase because they're afraid of their funds getting you know, seized, which in turn then drives fungibility <coughs> by driving money and investment away from companies that don't respect that. You know, and I think equally, you know, it's very likely Coinbase is spending a lot of money and effort trying to find ways to offer better fungibility. Any more? How do you model this out, the scalability issue? Did you use a program? Did you use your own personal theory? <clears throat> I mean, this is really, I think, a summary of kind of the general consensus among, you know, Bitcoin consensus experts on how, uh, how the system works. You know, I think you could kind of give, give the system to any computer science student and tell them, well, you know, I want to get these properties from the system, does it scale? And they'd go and come back and say, well, that's funny, if everyone wants to verify everything, does n squared scaling? You know, it's, it's not necessarily obvious until you go look at it, but, you know, I, I kind of can't say there's any more sophisticated approach I applied than understanding how the system works and then just, you know, looking at the consequences. Uh, where does that n squared number come from? Can you explain that part? So the thinking there is, well, if you have n people, and they all do some number of transactions each, to fully verify the blockchain in the current system, they have to go and verify everyone else's transactions. n times n is n squared. Well, and be, like n times n, n times m, I mean, in terms of you have like n validators and n transactions? Yes, well, if you go by, you know, o, um, big O notation, well, that would be your K factor. You know, each N does K transactions, and then the Ks drop out, and, you know, the big picture is N squared. Now, if you go make other assumptions, such as, I mean, let's suppose you assume people partially validate the chain, and, you know, someone finds something wrong, they publish it, and you hope that works. Yes, you can go improve on that, but that's in exchange for giving up worse behavior. You know, in that case, well, that n verifies some constant amount of the blockchain space. But if someone finds something wrong, well, you can do a civil attack on the network simultaneously and prevent anyone from learning about that for, say, a week. Well, someone says the blockchain a week ago is invalid. Now what do you do? I don't know. Do you roll back a week worth of transactions? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I suspect the answer is no, and we just accept someone created money out of thin air. You know, it's yes that we can, you know, create systems like that, but it is not the current architecture of Bitcoin. You know, that's changing the architecture. Thank you. Might, might be one more question. <laughs> uh, by any chance, uh, have you read uh, Bill White's paper about the usage of compact miracle trees of all open transactions with a slightly different transaction model? 
I've done some work along those lines, but those, um, I mean, it's, it's kind of frustrating in some way, because with those proposals, that's kind of the first half of my talk, which is you can do a ton of stuff for scaling, but you can't get away from this problem that somebody has got to have a, in the current architecture, have a full view of the blockchain to mine. You know, so even with Merkle tracing, with all this fancy stuff, you still end up with a fundamental problem that solved double spending. The people who are doing mining and actually creating blocks, they need to have the full blockchain. You know, they, they need to be able to go keep up with that full blockchain. And there's no easy ways around that, you know, without changing the architecture. Peter, you did a great job answering all the questions tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you.